Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the New Report Historical Commission meeting of 11 February 2021. Another, <clears throat> yet another in the string of virtual meetings conducted over Zoom. So by now, most of you are familiar with the various rules. Uh, the commissioners have their audio and video enabled. Uh, we, um, I should point out now, we do have a new commissioner that I'm hoping will be able to join us tonight. Uh, he was just sworn in this week. His name is Mark Sendron. Uh, lives here uh, on High Street. His family goes back in the town quite a way, quite a ways. I'll kind of let him do his own introduction. Hopefully, he'll be able to uh, to join us. Um, I know he was planning on it, so we'll see how that goes. Um, oh, and there he is. Okay, excellent. So, um, so I'll do a roll call in just a minute, but then I'll just go through a few preliminary um, housekeeping rules. Um, as I was saying, the, the commissioners will have their audio and videos enabled. And uh, of course, you all will use your mute button when you're not speaking just to keep the background noise down. If we have a public hearing or any kind of public comment period, uh, you, the public will be enabled one at a time to, to be recognized. Use the Zoom control to raise your hand. If you're on the telephone, I believe that is star nine to raise a hand and also star six to unmute. And remember that after we unmute you, you also have to unmute yourself um, your locally, in other words, on your device, whether it's a phone or an iPad or computer, whatever it is, you'll need to unmute yourself in your own uh, environment. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'll introduce uh, our commissioners. I believe, um, uh, well, yeah, I usually have them in alphabetical order. Um, so, um, and but Mr. Carnwath, I don't think has quite joined us yet, but I see our new member, Mr. Mark Sandrone, is here. So, Mark, you know, if you want to confirm your, you are actually here, saying something. I'm indeed. Thank you, Glenn. Okay. And, um, I'm very uh, thrilled to be part of this uh, group. Um, been thinking about it quite a bit in the last couple of weeks uh, with some trepidation as I um, have uh, <laughs> little or no experience in um, these kind of matters, but I am looking forward to learning and um, catching up as fast as I can. Uh, I've been doing some reading. Um, I've been in Newburyport since 1991 and um, have really enjoyed the city greatly. I couldn't think of any other place to live. I'm very fortunate to live in my grandparents' home that they have lived in for many, many years. They moved into that house in 1948. And prior to that, that house belonged to my grandmother's cousin. So it's been in the family for a bit. It's uh, built in 1809 and um, it's a beggar. It always needs more. You know, it uh, <laughs> requires... Uh, plenty of attention and uh, a uh, checkbook that gets depleted every so often. But that being said, um, the joys of living in an old house um, certainly outweigh the uh, little bit of frustrations and difficulties. And what's really nice about New Report is we have a lot more of these houses that I hope to, with you all, um, know more about and try to preserve and help and uh, certainly encourage people to take care of the way they should. So um, great joy to be with you all and uh, look forward to uh, uh, cooperating and working together and learning. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I was going to uh, invite you to say a little intro after we do the full uh, roll call, but you've done that, then that's perfectly fine. And I really appreciate you giving us a little bit of your personal background. And we're also looking forward to working with you. Um, so I will continue uh, the, the role with uh, Mr. Christopher Fay. Here. Okay, you're here. Uh, Mr. Joe Morgan. I'm here. Okay. Ms. I think. Yep, you're here. I had, I had, <laughs> tech, had a technical difficulty there, so. Oh, okay. I had to drop yep. out, but I'm back. Okay, we got gotcha. you. Um, Ms. Pecknick, Patricia Pecknick. Here. Okay, and myself, uh, Glenn Richards, the chair. And I think. Uh, Malcolm Carnweth is a member, but he's not here right now. And Mr. Peter McNamee is um, also a member who is absent tonight, um, I think due to, uh, uh, well, personal health reasons, but I help. we expect him back in the near future. So let's see, so that means we have, right now we have one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. five members. So we do have a legal quorum, which is four, and we may continue with um, a legal meeting. Uh, Caitlin Sullivan is also on the call hosting the Zoom meeting and Gretchen Joy, our minute taker. 
Okay, so I went through the other preliminaries about raising hands and zooming and all that. So we can move right on to uh, tonight's business. We do not have any applications for either dem demolition delay or um, or uh, advisory opinions to either the planning board or, or ZBA. So we, do, but we do have some general business. We have a couple of community preservation uh, fund applications. Uh, one from the Newburyport Preservation Trust, another one from the Newburyport Maritime Society, Inc. So um, let's see, let's take a look in the attendees. It looks like um, uh, I think there are some people from the Tr Preservation Trust. So why don't I do this? But actually, before I turn the floor, or I will let you uh, present your uh, project that you're but I just want to, especially for the benefit of our newest member, um, the you're probably familiar with the Community Preservation Act and its funds. The um, every year there are uh, one of the categories for getting CPC funds is historic preservation, and very often those applications will come to this board and describe their project and ask for a letter from us uh, supporting their project, which of course helps uh, their application. So we have two of those tonight. So without further ado, um, I see Tom Coulter Johns has been unmuted from our um, side, Tom, but you may be muted locally, but if, if you, I assume it, if you want to speak for the, uh, for this one, you, you can do so. Tom, you there? Hmm. Oh, you just got muted. You went. You were unmuted for a while. Now you're muted again. But it, at neither time did I did I hear anything from you. Um, we'll give you just another few seconds. Maybe you're having a technical glitch. I don't know. Is there anyone else? Uh, does anyone else on that in that attendee or participant list that, that can speak to this application? You can raise a hand. Okay. I see Stephanie Nikitas. You've been unmuted on our side, you want to speak? Um, we can I hear guess you. Pressed, I could. I hadn't not, I know that Tom had actually prepared uh, very well for this, but if, mm -hmm. if he can't sign in, I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to talk about this application. And I maybe uh, Andrea Eigerman mm -hmm. present. All, all three of you, all three of you have are unmuted on our end. So whoever can, um, if you know, I see Tom just unmuted himself locally. So you know, Tom, do you want to give it another try? See if we can hear you. <laughs> Not working, I'm afraid to say. So either is, stephanie or andrea anyone who would like to to talk to this you're welcome to this is andrea eigerman can you hear me yes we can okay well here maybe um stephanie maybe we can do this together i was not prepared either but um <laughs> this is an application for for the and do i have control of the no uh our host um does but you can so just tell Caitlin if there's something okay. you would like to you know go down a page or whatever right. you need. Right. Um, I think Caitlin, if you just want to show um, some of the photos, and they're down at the end, and maybe the historical photo. There we go. All right. So most of you are aware of um, the Garrison Birthplace. I hope at three to five School Street. This photo you're looking at is the um, historical photo. Um, and if you want to go to the next photo, this is what it looked like approximately 2019. Um, and recently the home was purchased by a developer. And if you go to the next photo, Caitlin, you'll see um, what it's looking like now. And the Newburyport Preservation Trust, Tom in particular, spent many hours with um, with the architect uh, talking about, and it's too bad Tom can't speak because he could really give you the details, mm. um, trying to preserve it in a sense that would return it to um, what it was like, more what it looked like in that historical photo. So he took special care with the center chimney and uh, with, the, with the windows. Um, mm -hmm. So he did as much as, the trust did as much as they could under the law um, without requiring permitting from you and from the city. Mm -hmm. um, and the developer was, was fairly cooperative as I understand it. But 
we'd like to do um, what we can um, to alert the community and educate the community to the birthplace. And so the application to the CPC is for um, two signs, two interpretive signs, um, 24 by 18 inches. And if you wanna go, Caitlin, to the next um, photo, um, this is Garrison Gardens. It's part of the Atwood Park. And this photo is taken from inside the gardens itself. And this is where we would propose to put two interpretive signs. And in October, the Parks Commission gave us um, approval to do that. And we're quite excited about the idea. Um, the signs, one sign would be on Garrison himself. And we have, um, we have a, um, a historian that is willing to research and write the text. And her name is Dr. Kate Larson. Um, she spoke in the first inaugural um, Garrison lecture in December. And she is excited to write the text should we get the funding. And the second sign would be on the house itself. And the idea of the topic on that sign would be about um, you know, when the house was built and how it's been preserved and um, the value of preserving a home like this um, to show people what, you know, not just the wealthy and the mansions of the period, but um, someone like Garrison, what he lived in and that you can start from humble beginnings and do all the amazing things that William Lloyd Garrison did for our country. Um, so that gives you the basics of, um, you know, our, our, our budget is, is really quite small. It's um, uh, just about $3,700 and it is for um, two signs and um, a graphic artist for their installation. And um, we just think this would be a great project for the city because it's great for the park. It's named after Garrison, but there's nothing on him right. in the park. And um, it's, he's a person that we want to celebrate. And right. it would all, the signs would also be complimentary to those that are at Brown Square. Um, right. You all recall that we have those, that signage. And, this would be complimentary, not not um, not copying what what's on those. Right. And quick, again, I wasn't prepared, but hopefully, yeah, no, that was it. actually you did. I thought you did a great job. Thank you okay. very much, Andrea. Um, quick, quick interruption, uh, uh, Caitlin. I see Malcolm. Uh, looks like he's in the attendee list. Uh, so if you can, if you can possibly promote him, I assume that 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 Malcolm is our Malcolm. So um, thanks. Um, quick question. This this slide we're looking at says. The location of proposed signs, plural. So are they both going to be together in that, that spot? Yes, they may be a few feet apart. Mm -hmm. The Parks Commission would like us, once we have the funds and actually have the um, signage in hand, mm -hmm. they would like us to come back for the exact locations. Right. Um, but they would, they would both be facing towards um, the home, the birthplace from within the gardens. Okay. And is it May I assume that there'll be, I know the ones around Brown Square are um, manufactured, for lack of a better word, in such a way that they're pretty much weatherproof. Is that the plan? Exactly. We have um, a couple of different estimates. One of them is in this application, um, and it was a company that was recommended to me from Lisa Reed, the uh, Parks Department right. the director, because it, they've worked well in the past. Okay. All right. No. And I don't know if but, Stephanie would like to add anything if there's, again, yeah. since I've been prepared, maybe there's something, Stephanie, that you think maybe I need to include. Well, no, I think that that was, uh, that was wonderful. And the only thing that I would add is that uh, what's not mentioned in the application is the Preservation Trust is also doing uh, new research on the house um, to... Uh, to update that research and the research that the Preservation Trust does could become part of an updated form B for the house. Oh, good. It's, it's also for the, for the sign related to the house. Right. So the Preservation Trust is, is donating that work. Mm -hmm. um, is there, I know there's, maybe you can't quite see it here. Is, is there going to be a, I know there's a 
plaque on the side of the house, this view we're looking at right here, it would, it would be the left side there. Is there also one on the front? Yes, uh, there, are two, there are two signs. Mm -hmm. um, and one is on the front left. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, they're not on in this picture. They are both oh, okay. back on the house now. Okay. One, um, Stephanie, help me remember, one of them is from a journalism right, society. Uh, the other is from, you know, do you recall? Uh, it's the City Improvement Society. Okay. Mark Sandron is probably pretty familiar with. It's a, it's a very old um, uh, group of people in the city. Um, <clears throat> As opposed, to a group of old, as opposed to a group of old people in the city. Well, but, uh, Mark, Mark is, the, Mark is the, the, the son of these people. Uh, but the, yes, the other sign, they're both beautiful. They're bronze plaques. And the other is from a, a journalism society to recognize uh, Garrison's right. role as a journalist. Right. Okay. Well, any, any did you Mark? Did you want to say make any comment? And also, I usually at this point turn it over to my colleagues here. Anyone have a question for the applicant or the the speaker? I see a hand up. Ms. Pecknick, is your hand up? It is, but I do not have a question. Uh, a statement. I have a statement. I just want to say congratulations to all of you who worked so hard on this project. I really appreciate everything that went into it. I'm thrilled that Kate is writing the signage. I think that's a great win for. For her, it's a great opportunity, but it's a great win for the project because her involvement raises the profile of this project because she is na a national figure, right. at least among historians, and she has the web page and all that. Right. And I appreciate the specific objective of educating people about Garrison and also the focus on why small historical homes can be equally as worthy of preservation or even more worthy of preservation. Mm -hmm than grander homes. And I love that the signs will be there also because although I was happy to see the bronze plaques, you know, reinstalled on the house, they they were always on that second floor. Right. And if you didn't know what you were looking for, yeah. then you didn't see them. So I'm really excited. And I just want to thank everyone who was involved with this project. All right. Thank you, Patricia. Anyone else have anything they'd like to say or question? No, it's a great idea. Thank you. That's what it sounded like, Mr. Fay. Malcolm, uh, we, we brought you into the panelist list. There was someone in the attendee list called Malcolm. Uh, I'm hoping that's you, but I just want to verify that. So could you unmute yourself and um, make sure we can hear you if you so you can be, uh, you know, count as, a, as an attendee to tonight's meeting, at least from this point? Sure. Can you hear me uh, now? We can hear you. Great. So welcome. Welcome back, Malcolm. Thank you for attending. Thank, thanks. Okay, so um, with, if there are no further questions or comments, uh, the chair would love to entertain a motion that we uh, submit a letter of support uh, that they can include with their application to the CPC that we uh, support their application, we meaning the NHC. Do I hear such a motion? So moved. Okay. Well, I saw Chris have Faye raise a hand and sound like Malcolm moved. So there's a motion on the floor. Chris, would you like to second it? I will second it, yes. Okay. Very good. So let's do a quick roll call. Uh, Malcolm, your vote? Yes. Okay. Well, one second. Give me, I need to get myself organized here for these votes. I didn't do one thing here. So, okay. So Malcolm was a yes. Okay. Mark Sendron? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Christopher Fay? Yes. Okay. Peter's not here. Mr. Joe Morgan? Yes. Okay. Ms. Pecknick? Yes. And the chair is also uh, in the affirmative on this. Um, yeah, we do support your application. And, um, uh, you know, I'll just make one quick comment about that house. In 1981, early spring, um, me and my sweetheart, not yet my wife, were looking to buy a house, and we looked at that house. It was on the market, and it was a wreck. We wished we could have <laughs> done something with it because, for our, because of our attachment to William Lloyd Garrison, we have great respect for him for a number of reasons. But it was just, it was just beyond, beyond. So we are, we well, we found another old house that we could. Have. So I'm very happy to see, even if, like I assume that the chimney isn't functional because I know that there's no masonry below it, I don't think, right? Um, according to the building plans, not. 
Yeah. But yeah, it, but it has been retained for the yeah. public view. Which is well, nice. Yeah, or I'm not even retained, probably installed, because if I don't that if you have that picture, I, it was the one, the picture from like a year or so ago that shows what it was, what it was before they just restored it. I think you'll see there is no central chimney. It was probably long right. gone, but whatever. So, All right, so very good. So, so this we will is kind of an exterior restoration exactly. to the period during which uh, William Lloyd Garrison lived there. Right. Okay. Well, we'll settle for that. Um, so what we'll do, uh, Stephanie and uh, Eileen, is it Eileen or Irene? Andrea. Uh, Andrea, Andrea mm -hmm. sorry. That's and right. <laughs> I was thinking everything because the EI, anyway, uh, mm -hmm. and Tom, if you can hear me anyway, we'll get, we'll get you that um, letter right away so you can include that with uh, your submission. Okay. Thank, Thank you so very much. much to all of you. Okay. You're quite welcome. Uh, the, we have a similar item on the agenda next. It's uh, an application from the Newburyport Maritime Society. We often think of them in terms of the Customs House. Um, so do we have a speaker from that organization who would like to speak? I see something, someone who just logged in as Custom House. And you are audio enabled from our point of view. I also see Greg calling, I believe, uh, yeah, and your hand is raised. So you are, Greg, you can speak uh, now if you would like. Sure. Great, um, my name is Greg Calling. I'm an architect with Merrimack Design Architects based in Exeter, New Hampshire. I'm a former resident of Newburyport and um, was involved in preservation there. When I lived there, I was a member and the treasurer of the Preservation Trust and I led architecture tours, historic architecture tours of Newburyport. And um, I've been working on the Custom House Maritime Museum since um, 2009. I was a um, I was the chair of the building committee back in 2009, and I oversaw some of the preservation projects over the years on the building. In 2013, we repointed the south facade on Water Street and the west facade, and. Um, and then I also oversaw a project to replace the slate roof in 2019. And we're continuing to do more preservation work to the building, which is necessary because the building had really not been properly um, preserved in 1973 when it was um, restored with HUD money. There have been chronic um, water issues in the building for years until um, until 2008, when um, several of the windows on the um, east facade and the north facade were replaced. So we're continuing with work, and part of the work that we're doing now is um, is air sealing the building and making it more energy efficient and um, and part of that project is to restore the doors on the front of the building and also replace the doors on the, the north side, the water side of the building. And um, Caitlin has, um, I believe, some images that I had sent to her to share. So we'll um, start with the with the front doors, the south doors on Water Street. They were, um, they date back to the 1872 uh, renovation of the building. The building originally had wrought iron shutters and doors. It was a, a fireproof masonry building with, with iron shutters. And in 1872, there were um, two over two windows were installed in the building, the shutters were removed and the front doors were replaced with the doors that you see today, which have um, their Greek revival doors with a stepped panel and they have um, oak buttons that um, go around the styles and rails of the door on the exterior. And on the inside, um, they reuse the old iron pintles from the iron doors and fabricated these quite complex cast iron hinges for these new doors. And 
what we're they're set in in um, a masonry opening, so there's no way to um, to apply a weather strip to the granite surround, and we're proposing to uh, weather strip those doors. We have a company called KSD. They're a um, a door company based in Boscow in New Hampshire. And they, they um, restore doors on historic buildings and they also um, fabricate new doors. They've um, restored some of the doors on, at the Harvard University campus. So if you could um, just jump to the next um, image. So in, in addition to weather stripping, um, making weather sealing the doors, we're also proposing to replace the hardware. The 1973 renovation, they ran out of money and um, they, they had a more um, ambitious plan for those front doors, which included a traditional cast iron rim lock. They ended up putting a, um, a residential apartment lock on the door and they also used a salvaged closer <laughs> which is just kind of blows my mind they're nine foot high doors and there's no way that a closer is going to operate properly with a nine foot high door of the um the weight of those doors so um over the years the the um the doors have have you know gotten wear and tear they were repainted, um, I believe, in 2003. Uh, they were stripped and repainted, and they used Abitron epoxy to re um, to restore them. And there's a there's an abandoned thumb latch on the door that we'd like to replace. And um, there is a utilitarian pole on the inside that I don't believe is original to the door that we'd like to replace. And um, this new lock will make the building more secure. Um, right now, when the museum is open, they have to leave that door ajar because there's no way to secure it. So the, the new hardware will help um, air seal the building and secure the building. And it will also make it safer and it will also be more accessible because they'll be, we'll be installing um, a lever on the inside, which will be easier to operate. So that's uh, the south doors. If you could go to the next, well, um, there are a couple more things I'll mention here. That's the photo from 2003 before they restored the doors then. And um, you can see on the right, there used to be a, a door knocker that was mounted on the panel which I don't believe was original to the doors either. And um, we're proposing in addition to the, the, the cast iron rim lock, which will be mounted on the interior side of the door, there'll be a ring pole that's on a spindle on the outside that you can turn and operate the lock from the outside. And there'll also be a, a, a contemporary key cylinder with a, with a brass cover. So that's, um, so we're, those doors we're proposing that they'll be removed. We'll put up a temporary plywood enclosure over the, over the granite architrave, the door surround, and then um, they'll be restored and then reinstalled. And next image, please. These are images of the north door from 2008 when um, this, it used to have Lexan side lights, which were replaced shortly after these photographs were taken. You can see the rot and the damage on the back. Um, they, uh, the architects that, that designed the, the 1973 restoration, Perry Dean Architects from Boston, they actually designed wood doors, um, reproduction doors for that um, for that opening, and they opted to put in um, aluminum storefront doors that are set into a, a wood frame. That wood frame obviously um, failed because of the exposure, and we're proposing um, to remove the aluminum storefront doors, which aren't appropriate to the building, 
and replace it with uh, doors that are that are more appropriate historically. So, uh, in case anyone is as confused as I was for a while there, the, in this slide we're looking at the picture on the upper right is sideways. <laughs> so, if you're wondering yeah, how that fits right. in, just rotate it ninety degrees. Yeah, this this right. is a copy of the of the existing conditions photos that um, that I, I found in the building records. Yeah, sorry, sorry, uh, Doug, took me a couple minutes to, <laughs> Greg rather. Sorry about that. To yeah, it's, yeah, what, to wait, wait a minute. The one <laughs> in the upper right clockwise. Yep. So, um, and also those, the aluminum storefront doors date to 1973 and they're beyond their service life. They've, um, they've received, um, Repairs over the years that you know there, there, there's wood blocking holding the door closures in place. There's no astragal at the center of the doors, so air just blows through the doors, and water also um, wind from wind, wind driven rain um, comes through at the threshold. So, um, next image, please. These, um, I'm just showing these for reference. These are um, the doors on the back of the New London Custom House, which is another um, Mills design, one of the four custom houses that he, New England custom houses that Mills designed. Um, so New London's on top. That's a, um, a V groove, a tongue and V groove board door with a shoe molding on the bottom. And the image below, um, number eight, is the back door of the New, the New Bedford Custom House. And that, again, is a V-groove board door. It had lights that were cut into it. That's an interior view of that door. Uh, next image, please. And then this is just an example of, this is a, actually a, a, rest, a reproduction door on a building at the Charlestown Navy Yard. And that's also a, a tongue and V group or door. So we're proposing to, to um, we've designed a, a door that's similar to that. If you could go to the next image. Oh, sorry. Um, well, another thing that we're doing with these doors, it's actually good to, to look at that image. That's the, a floodgate that um, slide that it's a temporary floodgate that you um, slide into to um, aluminum channels that would would be mounted in the jams of the door frame. And um, if you go to the next image, the drawings. These are the um, proposed <clears throat> drawings for the the south doors. That's the restoration. Um, drawing. Um, we're adding a shoe mold to the interior that will hold a brush weather seal. And then we're putting a small kerf in the perimeter of the door, the jams, to um, provide an air seal and then applying new hardware. Uh, next drawing, please. And then this is the proposed uh, design for the rear doors. Um, the rear doors are, are um, egress doors. Currently, they're, um, the pair of doors is five feet wide. They don't meet egress requirements. So this is, um, there's actually enough room there to provide a pair of um, a three foot, um, a pair of three foot doors with panic hardware. And um, it'll be all stainless steel hardware on the inside. And you'll just see a, a, a lever and an escutcheon with a cylinder on the exterior side. And matching the profiles of the um, of brick mold on the building, we're actually put um, the doors will be more recessed in the opening so that that brick mold and the face of the door aligns with the brick molds of the window sash above and to the left and right of the doors. Uh, the doors will have an astragal. They'll be weather sealed. There'll be a new aluminum threshold and commercial hardware. Oh, and um, we're also proposing to take away, there is also a pair of storefront aluminum doors on the interior side that create a vestibule 
And when the door is properly um, weather sealed, that won't be necessary. And that vestibule to swing between the doors does not meet code as well. So we're taking those away, which will make egress from the building safer. A couple, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I'm interrupting you, Greg. I had a couple of real quick questions. Sure. May I? Yes, please. Uh, first on the, I'm the guy who's not afraid to ask the question that seems to imply that I'm dumb. Could you refresh my memory on the astragal, what exactly that is? I think I knew it at one time, but I seem to have forgotten. Um, you can see it's on drawing seven on the left. It's um, the door leaves actually wrap one another. There's a, oh, it's, it's called true. an active leaf and an inactive leaf. So one stays closed most of the time, except for an emergency when someone hits the, the, um, the crash bar on the inside. Mm -hmm. And there's a coordinator that's um, at the head of the door that allows one door to close first before the other so that they, right. um, the astragal, that it doesn't get hung up and left in the open position. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and, um, oh, there's a, and the astragal in this, um, I'm sorry, the drawing, you have to um, scroll down. Uh, Aileen, please. Next, next drawing. So it's um, yeah, drawing seven there on the left, there's actually a double bead and um, those door leads interlock when they're right. in those Okay, positions. so you don't have the gap there for drafts and what have you. Right, and also for security. Right, okay. And uh, the other thing I wanted to follow up on, you said the front door, the south door at present needs to be left ajar, is that, because of because of safety reasons, if it if it's closed, it's hard to open or something. Or what's the deal with that? Well, when a visitor arrives, um, they can't. You can't open the door. You can't. Um, you can't leave the door in the locked position from the inside because then no one can open the door. They think the museum's closed, huh. so they leave the door ajar. There's no. There's only a pole on the outside. So there's no way to. Um, for the museum staff to secure the door and 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 while the museum's open, I see. But but I, okay. But I think if I understood your description of the new south door or the proposed south door, that would fix that problem because you'd have that swinging pull you just you showed right. Yeah, there instead of a knob that you turn, right. there's a, a a ring pull that you turn. Right. Right. Okay, let me turn to my, well, were you done? I'm sorry, were you done, uh, Greg? Did you yeah, want to say anything um, more? Yeah, that's, I think that's more or less everything. Okay, and I see Mr. Muir, who is also with the uh, Custom House. Did it, either of the other folks with the museum want to make any comments before I ask my colleagues if they have any questions or anything? Uh, this is Doug Muir. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yep, we can hear you fine, uh, Doug. But I think Greg covered everything that, uh, uh, we uh, we need to cover. I, I might mention one of the things that makes the north door part of the project somewhat complicated is that utilities have to come through that opening of uh -huh. electric utilities and also uh, the feed for the sprinkler system in the lawn in the back lawn. So that's one of the uh, complexities, and I think uh, I think uh, we've. Uh, uh, Greg's help, I think we've got that figured out. At least I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, That's thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mura. Uh, I see a hand up, one of my colleagues, Patricia Pecknick. Did you have a question or comment, Patricia? I, I have a comment because my question has been answered. I was going to ask whether they were working from evidence about what the original doors look like. So I'm very impressed with, you know, looking at the new London that tongue and groove board door, the other Mills design custom house and the new Bedford custom house. And I think it's thrilling that this North basement door will be replaced with wood because the custom house has in the summer, many events on the back lawn mm -hmm. and boy, have those aluminum doors been bothering me, <laughs> you know, ever since I set foot on the custom house, it's going to be so fantastic to have doors that are more historically appropriate. So well, there, there have been three previous attempts to design doors for this building, which none of them have come to fruition. The original design by Perry Dean had paneled doors that were sort of mimicked the front doors, which I don't think was, was appropriate for the back doors of the building. 
but um, yeah, and then uh, David Webb, the builder who worked on the window replacement on the building had some designs that he had worked on with Bill Finch, who's a preservation consultant for the back door. And they had uh, several different options for panel configurations. But I think just to simply have a tongue and groove, V groove, or door is the appropriate approach here. And I do think that um, with the activities that have been expanding at the Custom House and the events that they hold in the back lawn, I think this is much more appropriate um, treatment for the, for the rear door than, than what they have. Mm. Yeah, bravo. <laughs> yeah. I have a somewhat selfish question. Did you can I ask what species of wood you plan to use for that rear door? Um, probably Honduran or Sapelli mahogany. Mm, okay. Yeah, I suspect that. I have, have experience with board and batten doors with contemporary pine, and it just it doesn't last oh, very no, long. No pine. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I actually. I never use pine on exteriors on buildings, um, uh, particularly now because, you know, there's no yep. pine is, is fast growing. Oh, I know. Now. I it's yeah, it's it's useless. I I, I I guess I'll just say that I did buy some mahogany decking boards that I plan to try to make a board and batten door out of. So we'll see how I do. Okay, any other questions or comments from my fellow board members? Don't see hands. Not seeing any frantic waving or anything. Would someone care to make a motion that we uh, draft a letter that we can give to these applicants to support their application to the CPC. <coughs> Hello. I'll, uh, I'll make the motion to write a letter in support of this application. Thank you, Mr. Christopher Fay. So uh, there's a motion to, uh, to have a letter of support. Is that seconded? Yes, I'll second that. This is Joe Morgan. OK, thank you, Joe. So we'll do our roll call. Uh, Malcolm Conworth. Yes, I'm in support. Okay, Mr. Sendron? I am in support, yes. Okay, Mr. Fay? Yes. Okay, Mr. Morgan? Yes. Okay, Ms. Pecknick? Yes, sir. Okay, well, far from be it for me to be a contrarian, so I'll also vote yes. Okay, so uh, Greg and Doug and company, um, we'll get that together. Um, uh, expeditiously so you can uh, include an, a note from from us the historical commission uh, in support of your application uh, we wish you good luck i think we all on this board agree that uh, the custom house is one of those um, few one of those especially valuable rarities in town you know, like the like the old courthouse at the top of state street and and, and other really iconic newburyport locations um that uh and you've got a twin problem. You've got the structure that you want to preserve it as, as just a historic structure, but you also have a collection of artifacts inside that you also need to protect. I know you, you didn't mention that tonight, but I know from previous discussions that it's uh, raises a lot of concerns about air quality control, humidity control, and so on and so forth. So uh, I know we certainly appreciate the efforts that uh, your organization is doing to try to preserve both the structure and the artifacts therein. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so the uh, other things, um, there are just a few other uh, update E types of things. Uh, now on the Fowl's sign and storefront, I think Patricia is going to ha have a few <laughs> words to say about this. So, I'll uh, But I'll just introduce the topic by saying that um, we heard, I forget now exactly how we heard, but the, uh, I guess New England Development owns the property, but they have a new, um, tenant for the look for what we all think of as fouls. Uh, well, just fouls as pe people just call it fouls. It used to be, I, you know, many of us can remember when it was an actual <clears throat> news vendor, they had got every magazine under the sun in there. And on the other mm -hmm. side was the, the kind of a very old timey soda fountain was kind of a cool place to, to go into. Uh, and there is their iconic sign. So Patricia, I know you put this presentation together, so why don't I turn the floor over to you and you can talk to us about it. Okay, thank you. This is actually a long overdue discussion that I've meant to have for the whole time I've been on the commission. I'm really happy that we're gonna have a new 
uh, occupant in this space. It's been really, the last time anything happened there was when it, that horrible Christmas movie, A Ring for Christmas was filmed. And that was, <laughs> they used the storefront there. But it's been really sad to see the space unoccupied. I think part of the value of 17 State Street is not just the centrality of the location, but the big display windows, and of course the two signs, especially the neon sign, which is such a magnet and focal point for everyone walking around downtown. So I wanted to ask you guys to help me solve a couple mysteries today having to do with the sign. I will say, uh, you know, Stephen Fowle moved into this space. He was a seller of newspapers and candy and chocolate, cigars moved into this location in 1865. Before that, he was at different locations. He kind of started in Market Square and moved up, you know, storefront to storefront. He had started in 1852, just selling newspapers out of a shack near the railroad station. And he would get the, the papers that came in from the train and then sell them. And he finally landed in this space. So the form B on this building does list the neon sign and the storefront band sign with the Art Deco lettering. And so as Jennifer has explained to us, they, those two things are included in the exterior architectural features that are protected by our DOD ordinance. So those features can't be altered without review by our commission. I, I started thinking about how to get this message out there though, because since Fowles closed, you know, there've been different owners. And back in 2018, I know Kathleen O'Connor Ives was, you know, in the Daily News talking about the storefront and the signs and wondering if they were protected. They are, they are protected. But I want you to help me uh, figure something out. If you, Caitlin, can you show the next slide? Okay, so on the form B, here's what it says. It says a hanging metal sign with neon letters is mounted between the first and second bays on the second floor. Then it says the ivory metal panels above the window are incised with black lettering reading new store, foul soda shop in an art deco style font. So I know that when, you know, Fowl died in 1895 and his wife Hannah continued to operate the store. She hired Nicholas Arakelian in 1905 and then he, he clerked there. And when she retired in 1916, she gave him half the store. And then in 1920, he bought the other half. In 1941, he has the sole owner completed a total interior and exterior renovation. But one thing remained from the earlier era and that was the neon sign. So does anyone think they can figure out from the make and model of the cars, right? So um, in the, the neon, the ivory band sign is from 1941. We can see that in the pictures, right? But, you know, neon comes to the United States in 1923 from France, this guy, George Claude of Claude Neon. And then these signs were wildly popular throughout the 1920s. Actually, the depression puts a big damper on merchants enthusiasm for investing a lot of money in this kind of technology because it was relatively expensive. So by the time of World War II, most of the neon that we see in American cities was put up there in the 20s. We know there were several neon sign makers in Newburyport in the 30s. The police department was bragging in the newspaper about their fancy new neon sign in the late 30s. But I'd love to figure out <laughs> what year this photo is to kind of narrow it down, right? It's out, it's, was Neon didn't arrive in the country until 1923, but the sign was there before 1941. So I don't know about cars. I don't know my makes and models of cars. And of course, the way they made cars back then, they sure lasted a long time. So it does, if you, even if you know what year the cars are from, it doesn't help, it doesn't, you know, fix the date, but it might, I might be able to do some research to figure out like where Thurlow's is and other stores. Does anyone have any idea or does anyone know? Can you point me in a direction to figure out? Well, um, I'm not a car expert. I know somebody who kind of is, but the cars look vintage 1930s. Doesn't mean that okay. they, 
you know, I mean, it could be that they're 1930s, but it's pictures from 1940 because they're kind of in that era. That's, you know, they're, they're, they're bigger. I don't know what makes my father-in-law is kind of a bit of a car buff. So I could always, if you send me the photographs, I will, um, I could always run it by him. Cause sometimes he's like, yeah, that's a 1933 Dusseldorf. They only made <laughs> okay, cool. that real well that way. Um, okay. I love it. I he's love more it. of like a fifties and sixties guys, but you never know. Okay, cool. I, it makes me miss the old car show on state street. Um, yeah. Caitlin, can you show the next picture, please? Um, oh yeah, so here's the thing that really has been bothering me a lot. It, it's been bothering me that, um, that when files close in January, 1912, sometime thereafter, the Boston and New York papers, part of the sign disappeared. Mm -hmm. I know from the Daily News articles, front page stories with photos, that that part of the sign was still there in January, uh, 2012. I know when it became 17 State Street and then Moulton, I, I remember Kathy Moulton had talked about, uh, she discussed the sign and was talking about um, painting it or preserving it or doing, you know, using Art Deco lettering on the glass window of the, of the restaurant to kind of match the, the metal sign up there. But when the restaurant closed in April 2018, there was another front page photo on the Daily News showing the sign without that piece. So I would kind of like, Glenn, <laughs> I would like the chair. I would like you, you know, she lives up in Kingston, New Hampshire. I wonder if you could reach out to her and just ask, or maybe the super fine guys, you know, it, the, the, the little piece could have been put inside the super fine guys, gutted the interior, like, the reason it's important is because Stephen Fowl started with the newspaper business and it sort of connects that whole history to that location. I just, I, I wish I knew where that part of the sign went. Um, mm -hmm. And then can you show us the next slide? I, by the way, uh, Patricia, I think in that picture from the Ford, so you, that first picture we looked at is slide number two, Caitlin. Are you, are you trying to date that photo? I'm trying to date the photo. I, I know from another photo later on that the okay. sign was there by 1940. And it looks like the Boston and New York papers is there too on this. Right. It's an original part of the original neon sign okay. that was put up in the 30s. That's why I'm saying okay. it got to find it. but like I wish someone after they dismantled it, they would have right. done something with it so that we could, you know, okay. I hope it's not like in a man cave somewhere. Um, can you show us the <laughs> can, I, can I just can I just interject this probably doesn't so you know the you know 1941 but um the cars are you know for us the cars are going the wrong direction right so yeah, I, don't, I noticed that too Chris I don't know when State Street became one way going up in the 30s right wasn't it the 30s no. with it with I think that it was later day? no it was much could be later it could be post it, is? it was in the 70s oh in the 70s <laughs> okay thank you Mark okay um, okay, so, uh, oh yeah, that's just, you know, 1912, 1913, talking about the location and then slide five. Just so we, yeah, we just see a few different, you know, there was more neon than that. This is the last one left. And six, I think we can see the snowy, snowy. Oh, day. sign's in nice shape in this one. Yeah, I mean, so is the, 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 the ivory metal there and then seven this is a newspaper article that shows when fowls was going to be completely renovated inside mm -hmm. and out because nickus arakelian said okay we're putting in the latest soda fountain the most beautiful stools hmm. and this beautiful light wood which then got you know ripped out if you look at slide eight caitlin um okay Look at this. So this is a sign after the, it's 1941, right? When the renovation is, is beginning. And the headline says, as Fowles news, news agency used to appear. So you can see how the very front, like on the top, it was that ivory thing was black with hmm. probably gold lettering, but you can see the neon above it. So that's yeah. how you know, the sign was there. In other words, the ivory art deco thing is 1941, but we know the sign is there before that because yeah. this is the before the renovation. Picture. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, I think the ivory, that band, 
uh, it, it also explains why the hanging, the neon sign is over on the left, displaced between those first two bays, because as the caption says, it was just before he, t he took over the vacant store just above it on State Street. So yeah. in other words, to the right. So he expanded over to the right, which kind of explains that odd layout it had, whereas like one half of it was yeah. almost a different kind of store than the left half. Anyway, yeah. so yeah, interesting. And then what's the next slide is not maybe nine. Um, yeah, and so then this is when the renovation's done, showing the beautiful new Art Deco mm. lettering in the front. And there might be a couple more images of, yeah. And then, <laughs> modern as tomorrow <laughs> yeah yeah oh it, and it's heartbreaking to look at the inside because we all remember but see at this point hmm. um and this is 2001 you see the two sections one said boston and new york newspapers hmm. and the other said coffee and coffee roasters something like that so the, the lower part disappeared first and then the upper part disappeared um hmm. Okay, and then I think there's one or two more things that I wanted to show you guys. Right, right, Fowls look to be preserved. Yeah, um, yeah, N not at all, right? I did like super fine foods, but, um, and then the last one might be, oh yes, this is in 2002 when it was getting repaired and rehung and they did then rehang the, the, the other two little parts of it. The next slide, I think, is from the form B. So B, C and the form B, both of those little yeah. words, things are there. Yeah. Meaning they were, you know, in the 80s, they were part of the, the sign. And the last thing I want to show you guys is slide 15. This has nothing to do with fowls, but rather was on the National Alliance of Preservation Commission's website because one of their members surveyed all the websites of all the historical commissions in the state. And Newburyport has a high level of information and a very good write-up. So I just wanna say whoever does the website, like shout out, because a lot of them say low, low or medium amount of information. So our website is doing well out there. So that's my presentation on this sign and just anything, any, um, the storefront, the display windows, the band sign, the neon sign, all of that is protected by our ordinances and alterations would need to come through the commission. And I wish we could know what happened to the other parts of the sign. And I, it, I wonder if they're still in the interior, if the new owner happens upon them, if she might uh, let us know that they're there. I'm not saying they need to be rehung, but maybe they do. Or at least certainly. preserved at the very least. They might you want know, to. Certainly they shouldn't be. Um, we, can, we, can, we can sell them on the coolness factor. I mean, I, I would, I'm willing, I'd say cash reward, you know, I, I personally, <laughs> I would, I would kick in a cash reward for the other parts of the sign. So, huh. um, so um, Mr. Chair, would it yes. be possible for you to reach out to the the uh, the owner of 17 State Street that the owner or the tenant, or the tenant the tenant in 2018 um Kathy and see maybe if if she 2018 I'd have to go back in time um what was what's the name of the tenant um Kathy Moulton she lives up in yeah. Kingston New Hampshire and actually her mom her mom had Kathy's is it bakery or donut shop on Mary Mac Street once upon a time? Um, oh, the one up that used to be a Webster's Dairy, that one? Um, yeah, Webster's. <laughs> yeah. I'm just okay. wondering if she might have seen it or maybe if she doesn't know if the super fine guys know. And if um, someone what, crashed what, it, then you know we'll never get it back, but it might what, be sitting inside the restaurant somewhere. Okay, what's the I don't understand the, the super fine connection. What is that? Oh, because Molt Kathy Moulton had the space from 2012 to 2018. Yeah. And then Super Fine, the guys who own Super Fine restaurant moved in and they totally redid the interior. Remember, they did a gut remodel of the interior, took out all the blonde wood, redid that, and then they were only there for a year and a half maybe. okay maybe that's why i don't maybe that's why it doesn't ring a bell yeah. yeah so just in case one of those former tenants knows and says oh yes i took it down and i put it inside okay 
Perhaps uh, I can try. If the owners yeah. of Brian, if they go in there to do whatever they're doing and they say, mm -hmm. oh, look, here's a little thing that says yeah. Boston and New yeah. York newspapers, they'll understand that it's right. part of this historic yep. sign. Let's it's not use it for kindling. <laughs> um, Mr. Chair, it's Caitlin. I just wanted to mention that um, Chris Skiba from Newburyport Developments on the call and was raising his hand. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Thanks. I also see Andrea Eigerman's hand raised. That may be an accident or a leftover. But uh, Chris, did you, uh, we have permitted or opened your audio on our end. You'll need to unmute yourself uh, on your end. And uh, if you wish to make, you know, make a statement or yeah, some sort. I can check in with um, Kathy Moulton and um, the super fine folks and see. I know it's not in the space. Um, oh, the sign okay. you're referring to, but I, I can check in with those former tenants and see if they um, know of its whereabouts. Oh, thank you. That would be great just to know. I mean, I imagine it might not be recoverable, but in case it is, it'd be great to have it back. Thank you very much, Chris. We appreciate that. No problem. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Patricia. Did you, uh, your uh, your research powers never cease to amaze me. <laughs> well, everyone loved that sign and I really think that sign yeah. benefits any tenant in that building because yeah. that's what, where it's all eyes go to that space. Yeah. And that's part of what's yeah. been so sad about not having it occupied because yeah. you always, you're drawn to it and then you say, oh, that's, you know, it's too bad. It's yeah, you bad. know, and I, I can make, I can, you know, for those who might, wonder about the value of some of these old signs i would point out something else there is a new brand new restaurant down to, on the waterfront area the foot of green street that was formerly well, among other things its most recent incarnation before the restaurant was an auto parts store and they saw fit to uh, not just keep but actually restore and keep the uh, wonderful old neon sign that said carburetor repairs notwithstanding the fact that they don't do carburetor repairs <laughs> few cars even have carburetors these days but in any event uh what it my point is that these old um nods to the past people like them i mean i don't think it's just us weirdos that like them uh, people in general find them you know it, it's a uh, it's just a nice reminder that you know we're not the first ones to set foot on this planet and things have come come before us things will come after us and it's nice to to see these little artifacts uh from our past and how you know you look at a sign like this or the carburetor one and you see how you know people devoted a you know considerable energy to designing these things and and making them you know to a certain standard and and so on you know it's not just like that like the art deco band you know band sign it's it's you know they obviously had a certain amount of pride they took in you know doing something that they thought was gonna say hey look at us we're we're new and modern we're right up there with the times and you know etc anyway enough of my little spiel and if i can at some point more closely date the neon sign i will definitely give that information to new england development and the whatever tenant is in the building it's just good information to have i suppose okay so, well, thanks so much whoever has sorry go ahead no, i was just i was just thinking i was just saying thank you to uh, patricia go ahead chris i was gonna say send me that photograph the one that's up there now whoever has it i will yep i'll see if we can i mean i got a whole army of students too we can Make a oh, what a great project. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and I, I know uh, our newest member, Mark Sandrone, does have some familiarity with older vehicles, not such pedestrian ones as these, but I, I didn't hear you comment, so I guess you don't don't have any insight to offer on the potential age of some of the, the newer cars there. That, that, that very first one looks newer than the next couple ones, and then way up at the edge of the picture, that looks like a car that could be a newer vintage. Um, late 40s ish. I totally agree with Chris. I think 1935. Really? Even that car right up front? That's that old? Um, 35, 40, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, 40, I can believe, even earlier than 40, but yeah. yeah. Then, uh, okay. At any rate, well, thanks again, Patricia. I want to move to the rest of the agenda. Um, there's an update. Um, you might recall in our last meeting, there was uh, an item on the agenda to talk about 
building code as it relates to historic structures, and we put it off to, to the next meeting so Andy Port could attend. Of course, he had another conflict uh, tonight, but that but we did discuss it, Patricia, myself, Caitlin, and others. So uh, all we really – there's nothing really to – do for us, but I did want you all to know the context of this was sometimes an applicant will come to us and they'll say, oh, I have to uh, raise, I have to do X, Y, Z because uh, my old house doesn't meet current building codes. Well, it turns out that uh, the our, in their ultimate wisdom, our legislatures apparently understood that, well, a house built in 1800 isn't going to meet the code that was uh, printed in 1964. So um, they understand that, and uh, these there's a considerable amount of latitude. There's first of all, there's kind of the concept of being grandfathered in. Um, and whatever. Okay. That the We're wheels live. Are okay. Well, it's 6:59, so I'm going to. Give us a, why don't you take a minute before we officially start, Caitlin, to take a look over in the attendees, see if we have a evidence of uh, Mark. I'm not seeing him yet. Okay. He's not... Uh, Okay, well, I've got seven o'clock on the dot now, <clears throat> official computer time, so we'll get started. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the New Report Historical Commission meeting of 11 February, 2021. Another, <clears throat> yet another in the string of virtual meetings conducted over Zoom. So by now, most of you are familiar with the various rules. Uh, the commissioners have their audio and video enabled. Uh, we, um, I should point out now, we do have a new Commissioner that I'm hoping will be able to join us tonight. Uh, he was just sworn in this week. His name is Mark Sendron. Uh, lives here uh, on High Street. His family goes back in the town quite a way, quite a ways. I'll kind of let him do his own introduction. Hopefully, he'll be able to uh, to join us. Um, I know he was planning on it, so we'll see how that goes. Um, oh, and there he is. Okay, excellent. So. Um, so I'll do a roll call in just a minute, but then I'll just go through a few preliminary um, housekeeping rules. Um, as I was saying, the, the commissioners will have their audio and videos enabled. And uh, of course, you all will use your mute button when you're not speaking just to keep the background noise down. If we have a public hearing or any kind of public comment period, uh, you, the public will be enabled one at a time to to be recognized. Use the Zoom control to raise your hand. If you're on the telephone, I believe that is star nine to raise a hand and also star six to unmute. And remember that after we unmute you, you also have to unmute yourself um, your, locally. In other words, on your device, whether it's a phone or an iPad or computer, whatever it is, you'll need to unmute yourself in your own uh, environment. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'll introduce uh, our commissioners. I believe, um, uh, well, I usually have them in alphabetical order. Um, so, um, and but Mr. Carnroth, I don't think has quite joined us yet, but I see our new member, Mr. Mark Sandrone, is here. So, Mark, if you want to confirm your, you are actually here, saying something. I'm indeed. Thank you, Glenn. Okay. And, um, I'm very uh, thrilled to be part of this uh, group. Um, been thinking about it quite a bit in the last couple of weeks uh, with some trepidation as I um, <laughs> have uh, little or no experience in um, these kind of matters, but I am looking forward to learning and um, catching up as fast as I can. Uh, I've been doing some reading. Um, I've been in New Report since 1991 and um, have really enjoyed the city greatly. I couldn't think of any other place to live. I'm very fortunate to live in my grandparents' home that they have lived in for many, many years. They moved into that house in 1948. And prior to that, that house belonged to my grandmother's cousin. So it's been in the family for a bit. It's uh, built in 1809 and um, it's a beggar. It always needs more. It you know, <laughs> uh, requires... Uh, plenty of attention and uh, a uh, checkbook that gets depleted every so often. But that being said, um, the joys of living in a old house um, 
certainly outweigh the uh, little bit of frustrations and difficulties. And what's really nice about Newburyport is we have a lot more of these houses that I hope to, with you all, um, know more about and try to preserve and help and uh, certainly encourage people to take care of the way they should. So um, great joy to be with you all and uh, look forward to uh, uh, cooperating and working together and learning. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I was going to uh, invite you to say a little intro after we do the full uh, roll call, but you've done that, then that's perfectly fine. And I really appreciate you giving us a little bit of your personal background, and we're also looking forward to working with you. Um, so I will continue uh, the, the role with uh, Mr. Christopher Fay. Here. Okay, you're here. Uh, Mr. Joe Morgan. I'm here. Okay. Ms. I think. Yep, you're here. I had, I had a technical difficulty there, so. Oh, okay. Had to drop yep. out, but I'm back. Okay, we got gotcha. you. Um, Ms. Picnic, Patricia Picnic. Here. Okay, and myself, uh, Glenn Richards, the chair. And I think uh, Malcolm Carnweth is a member, but he's not here right now. And Mr. Peter McNamee is um, also a member who is absent tonight, um, I think, due to, uh, uh, well, personal health reasons, but I hope we expect him back in the near future. So let's see if so that means we have right now we have one, two, three, four, five members. So we do have a legal quorum, which is four, and we may continue with um, a legal meeting. Uh, Caitlin Sullivan is also on the call hosting the Zoom meeting and Gretchen Joy, our minute taker. Okay, so I went through the other preliminaries about raising hands and Zooming and all that so we can move right on to uh, tonight's business. We do not have any applications for either dem demolition delay or, um, or uh, advisory opinions to either the planning board or, or ZBA. So we, but we do have some general business. We have a couple of community preservation uh, fund applications. Uh, one from the Newburyport Preservation Trust, another one from the Newburyport Maritime Society, Inc. So um, let's see, let's take a look in the attendees. It looks like, um, uh, I think there are some people from the Tr Preservation Trust. So why don't I do this? But actually, before I turn the floor, or I will let you uh, present your uh, project that you're, but I just want to, especially for the benefit of our newest member, um, the, you're probably familiar with the Community Preservation Act and its funds. The um, every year there are 